Welcome to High Level History, where we explore history through the lens of powerful dynasties, like today's episode on the British royal family, India, and the Delhi Darbar. The Delhi Darbar. The term Delhi Darbar refers to a grand ceremonial gathering held by the British colonial authorities in India during the period of British rule known as the British Raj. The Darbars were organized to display power and authority of the British crown, and more importantly symbolize the British Empire's dominion over India. To understand why the British government felt the need to exercise Darbars, we have to go back to 1757, to the Battle of Plassey. The first half of British intervention on the Indian subcontinent was not under direct government or royal rule. The British East India Company, one of the first modern multinational corporations, grew their business operations on the subcontinent, with the official start of company rule, that is to say governance by a private company, generally believed to have begun in 1757 after the Battle of Plassey. The battle was fought between Robert Clive's British East India forces and the Nawab of, the Nawab of Bengal, Siraj ad -Dawla. The British conspired with one of the Nawab's generals, Mir Jafar, promising to install him as the new Nawab after the battle if he defected to the company's side. At the subsequent Battle of Plassey, Clive's forces emerged victorious and enabled British influence over the continent to expand due to their control of the new Nawab. Ultimately, the British East India Company ruled over large tracts of the subcontinent, either directly or indirectly, until the Indian Rebellion, or Sepoy Mutiny, of 1857, at which point, in 1858, control was handed over to the British government, now known as the British Raj. The British government passed the Government of India Act in 1858, which transferred the power to govern India from the East India Company to the British Crown, marking the beginning of the British Raj, which lasted until India gained independence nearly 90 years later in 1947. The idea of creating Queen Victoria Empress had first been publicly suggested in 1843 by Lord Ellensborough, a Viceroy of India. According to reports, however, the Queen wanted an imperial title for herself, for more personal reasons. It has been contemplated that Victoria's urgency in acquiring a title had been due to her own personal issues, namely her firstborn daughter's eventual elevation to German Empress. Crown Princess Victoria was married to Crown Prince Frederick of Prussia, the future German Emperor. Upon her elevation to German Empress, Victoria would outrank her mother, something Queen Victoria likely could not fathom. She was also reportedly annoyed that Tsar Alexander II of Russia held a higher rank than her, again, due to his status as an emperor of Russia. The pressure employed by the queen for an imperial title eventually broke Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. The two had a close relationship, likely due to Israeli's intense flattery of the queen. As such, he tabled the Royal Titles Act of 1876. In response, the queen conceded to opening parliament in person, something she had loathed to do since the death of her husband, Prince Albert. The Royal Titles Act of 1876 conferred the title of Empress of India on Victoria and on all subsequent monarchs. This brings us to the Delhi Darbar. As part of the subsequent successions, the British Raj held massive Darbars to showcase British capability over their new dominion and as a show of strength to help disincentivize future rebellions. They needed to display both to public and native rule both to the public and to native rulers in India a projection of imperial power. The Darbars were not new to India, however. Rulers had done similar, particularly the long-ruling Mughals. The holding of a Darbar in line with previous rulers showed a shift in policy away from company rule to royal rule. It signified the British crown stepping into the previous stability of Mughals and other long-reigning dynasties, unlike the actions of the company. Where the British differed was setting up Darbars as part of the coronation of a new ruler. As such, each of the Darbars included a traditional show of fealty from participating Indian princes in order of hierarchy. There was also a display of military might, like modern-day parade or drilling, another flex of British imperial muscle to further symbolize their control over the country. Part of the symbolism included where the Darbar would be held, thus Coronation Park was born. Each of the British Raj Darbars would be held in Delhi at this park. Delhi itself was chosen due to its historical significance in India, particularly, particularly during the Mughal era, showing yet again the British use of established history to cement and legitimize their power. The British Raj Darbars occurred in 1877, 1903, and 1911, corresponding with the coronations of that era. That brings us to the Delhi Darbar of 1877. 
also known as the Proclamation Darbar because it featured a formal proclamation by the Viceroy of India, Lord Lytton, in which Queen Victoria assumed her new title as Empress of India. The commemorative Darbar was organized by Thomas Henry Thornton, with some reports mentioning 70,000 people in attendance for the ceremonial entrance. It was largely, however, an event for the highest echelon of Indian society, attended by Nawabs, Maharajas, and other high-level dignitaries in the Raj. It was at this Darbar that the Empress of India Medal, or the Kaiser Hind Medal, KIH Medal for short, was first struck. This Darbar is also the point in time that many historians point to as the beginning of the Free India Campaign. Ganesh Vaswedo Joshi read a statement on behalf of the new political organization from which the Indian National Congress would grow. Joshi's statement included the following request, for Her Majesty to grant India the same political and social status as is enjoyed by her British subjects. This Darbar has also been controversial due to the concurrent Great Famine of 1876 and 78. Many critics argued that the fund should not have been diverted from relief efforts for what was essentially a party for the ruling class of India. Another complication around the time of the Darbar was the Prince of Wales's trip to India. The future Edward VII was touring India in 1875 and 76, while his mother the Queen was contemplating taking the title of Empress. The Prince was reportedly incensed that he was not included in the decision-making process. Others have argued that the Prince's successful trip in India made the elevation to Empress more palatable to the public. The future King and Emperor enjoyed his time in India, though he was disgusted by the racism displayed by the Europeans. Because a man has a black face and a different religion from our own, there is no reason why he should be treated as a prude, he was reportedly, he reportedly said. This brings us to the Delhi Darbar of 1903. This Darbar celebrated the coronation of the aforementioned Queen Edward VII and his wife King, Queen Alexandra as Emperor and Empress of India. This Darbar was massive and more open to the public than the previous iteration. It was truly a magnificent affair. It lasted an entire two weeks and was organized by the Viceroy of India, Lord Curzon. The planning was meticulous, with logistics entangled entirely by the Viceroy himself. The scale of festivities required equally impressive planning. Lord Curzon began the affair at the end of 1902. He embarked on a massive infrastructure project, erecting an entire temporary tent city solely for the event. It was a colorful display of modern technology and ancient Indian history. Beyond the event, the city itself was a marvel, complete with its own police force, special uniform, post office and stamp, telephone, railway, commercial stores, a court, hospital, and modern sanitation drainage. There was also the relatively new technology of electric light installations. It was an entirely new city built just for a single event. The Darbar also marked a commercial turn in this event's history, with guidebooks and maps of the event being sold to, to the general public. As with the previous Darbar, there was also a special medal struck for this event, called the Delhi Darbar Medal. Unfortunately for Lord Corzon, the newly crowned King Edward VII did not attend the event, and instead he sent his younger brother, the Duke of Connaught and Strathern. As with the previous Darbar, all of the Indian royalty also attended the event. In total, some 100,000 people went to Delhi and attended the Darbar from across India and the world. Further expanding on the event's footprint was its film reel. The Darbar of 1903 was the first filmed event on the subcontinent, with the subsequent clips played at theatres across the Commonwealth. The clips also served as a tool to further cement British rule in India. Some trace the early beginnings of Bollywood, India's massive film industry, to these clips. In total, the Darbar of 1903 cost the government of India approximately £260,000. This is equivalent to roughly £26 million in today's currency when you account for inflation. The Delhi Darbar of 1911. This Darbar, like the previous two, was a coronation celebration, this time for King George V and Queen Mary. Organized by the Viceroy of India, Lord Hardinge, it was a historic event as it marked the reversal of the partition of Bengal, which occurred a mere six years prior in 1905. Another significant event was the shift of the British capital in India away from Calcutta to Delhi. This again shows the entrenchment of British rule in India, with the establishment of a centralized capital from which to manage their occupancy. However, what truly separates this Darbar from the previous two was the attendance of the newly crowned royal couple. King George and Queen Mary left Britain on the RMS Medina, a state-of-the-art ocean liner arriving in under a month to Delhi. They continued through the city being received by the commander-in-chief in India, Lord Kitchener, and some 50,000 troops. For the ceremony, a special imperial crown was created as the crown jewels were not allowed to leave England. Weighing two pounds, it was set with 6,100 diamonds, nine emeralds, four rubies, and four sapphires yet another imperial symbol of hegemony. For the king, 
The crown was deeply uncomfortable, and he reported his head hurting after wearing it for over three hours. The crown was designed specifically for India and events held there. As such, it has been only worn once and now resides in the Tower of London. Overall, the king and queen enjoyed their time in India, with King George calling the Darbar the most wonderful and beautiful sight I saw. In addition to the Darbar, the king and queen also did their Jaroka Darshan, or balcony appearance. Yet another Mughal ceremony the British Raj co-opted, their appearance was massively successful. It is reported that 500,000 turned up for the event. As with previous ceremonies, there were probably over 100,000 people present for parts of the event, with additional troops numbered in the thousands and a massive show of military strength, strength as, with, as was the norm of the Darbars. The British also produced a film titled With Our King and Queen in India, or The Darbar in Delhi. The film, which was silent, had a massive impact on audience across, audiences across the globe. King George actually saw the film with some of his relations, including Empress Maria of Russia, when he came back home. She sent a letter to her son Nicholas, the future czar, about the film. We are lunching today with Georgie and May at Buckingham Palace. They both send you greetings. Last night we saw their journey to India. Cinema color is a wonderful, wonderfully interesting and very beautiful and gives one the impression of having seen it all in reality. The Darbar of 1911 cost roughly £1 million, which equates to £97 million today. This cost includes the transportation and entertainment of the royal couple, which was likely an exorbitant cost. It's important to note that these Delhi Darbars are not only ceremonial gatherings, but also symbolic acts of asserting British imperial authority over India. There were opportunities for the British rulers to display their might and influence, as well as to seek the support and loyalty of Indian princely states and elites, the support they needed to maintain their rule. However, they were also criticized for their extravagance and the vast sums of money spent on organizing them, which often contrasted starkly with the widespread poverty and deprivation of colonial India. These events would not have been possible if not for the domestic capabilities of workers in India. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. Thank you for listening.